Ismi Pasha, known as Ishmael the Magnificent, was the Khedive of Egypt and Sudan from 1863 to 1879, when he was removed at the behest of the United Kingdom, sharing the ambitious outlook of his grandfather, Muhammad Ali Pasha. He greatly modernized Egypt and Sudan during his reign, investing heavily in industrial and economic development, urbanization, and the expansion of the country's boundaries in Africa. His philosophy can be glimpsed at in a statement that he made in 1879. My country is no longer in Africa, we are now part of Europe. It is therefore natural for us to abandon our former ways and to adopt a new system adapted to our social conditions. In 1867 he also secured Ottoman an international recognition for his title of Khedive in preference to Wali which was previously used by his predecessors in the Ottoman Ayelet of Egypt and Sudan. However, Ishmael's policies placed the Ottoman Khedivate of Egypt and Sudan in severe debt, leading to the sale of the country's shares in the Suez Canal Company to the United Kingdom, and his ultimate toppling from power at British hands. Family the second of the three sons of Ibrahim Pasha and the grandson of Muhammad Ali, Ishmael, of Albanian descent, was born in Cairo at Al Musafir Khan Palace. His mother was Hoshia, third wife of his father. She was reportedly a sister of Validus Sultan Patevniel. Patevniel was a wife of Mahmud II of the Ottoman Empire and mother of Abdulaziz I. Youth and Education After receiving a European education in Paris where he attended the École de l'Acute TAT major, he returned home, and on the death of his elder brother became heir to his uncle, Sedai, the Wali and Khedive of Egypt and Sudan. Said, who apparently conceived his own safety to lie in ridding himself as much as possible of the presence of his nephew, employed him in the next few years on missions abroad, notably to the Pope, the Emperor Napoleon III, and the Sultan of Ottoman Empire. In 1861 he was dispatched at the head of an army of 18,000 to quell an insurrection in Sudan, a mission which he successfully accomplished. Khedive of Egypt after the death of said, Ismail was proclaimed Khedive on January 19, 1863. Though the Ottoman Empire and the other great powers recognized him only as Wali, like all Egyptian and Sudanese rulers since his grandfather Muhammad Ali Pasha, he claimed the higher title of Khedive, which the Ottoman port had consistently refused to sanction. Finally, in 1867, Ismi succeeded in persuading the Ottoman Sultan Abdulaziz to grant a firm and finally recognizing him as Khedive in exchange for an increase in the tribute. Another firm and changed the law of succession to direct descent from father to son rather than brother to brother, and a further decree in 1873 confirmed the virtual independence of the Khedivate of Egypt from the port. Reforms Ishmael launched vast schemes of internal reform on the scale of his grandfather, remodeling the customs system and the post office, stimulating commercial progress, creating a sugar industry, building palaces, entertaining lavishly, and maintaining an opera and a theater. He greatly expanded Cairo, building an entire new quarter of the city on its western edge modeled on Paris. Alexandria was also improved. He launched a vast railroad building project that saw Egypt and Sudan rise from having virtually none to the most railways per habitable kilometer of any nation in the world. One of his most significant achievements was to establish an assembly of delegates in November 1866. Though this was supposed to be a purely advisory body, its members eventually came to have an important influence on governmental affairs. This was shown in 1876, when the assembly persuaded Ishmael to reinstate the law that allowed land ownership and tax privileges to persons paying six years land tax in advance. Ismail tried to reduce slave trading and extended Egypt's rule in Africa. In 1874 he annexed Darfur but was prevented from expanding into Ethiopia after his army was repeatedly defeated by Emperor Johannes IV. 
first at Gundat on 16 November 1875, and again at Gura in March of the following year. War with Ethiopia Ishmael dreamt of expanding his realm across the entire Nile including its diverse sources, and over the whole African coast of the Red Sea. This, together with rumors about rich raw material and fertile soil, led Ishmael to expansive policies directed against Ethiopia under the Emperor Johannes IV. In 1865 the Ottoman Sublime Port ceded the Ottoman province of Habesh to Ishmael. This province, neighbor of Ethiopia, first consisted of a coastal strip only but expanded subsequently inland into territory controlled by the Ethiopian ruler. Here Ishmael occupied regions originally claimed by the Ottomans when they had established the province of Habesh in the 16th century. New economically promising projects, like huge cotton plantations in the Barker Delta, were started. In 1872, Bogos was annexed by the governor of the new province of eastern Sudan and the Red Sea coast, Werner Munzinga Pasha. In October 1875 Ishmael's army occupied the adjacent highlands of Hamasian, which were then tributary to the Ethiopian emperor. In March 1876 Ishmael's army suffered a dramatic defeat after an attack by Johannes's army at Gura. Ismail's son Hassan was captured by the Ethiopians and only released after a large ransom. This was followed by a long Cold War, only finishing in 1884 with the Anglo-Egyptian-Ethiopian Hewitt Treaty, when Bogos was given back to Ethiopia. The Red Sea province created by Ishmael and his governor Munzinga Pasha was taken over by the Italians shortly thereafter and became the territorial basis for the Colonia Eritrea. Suez Canal Ishmael's could evade is closely connected to the building of the Suez Canal. He agreed to, and oversaw, the Egyptian portion of its construction. On his accession, he refused to ratify the concessions to the canal company made by said, and the question was referred in 1864 to the arbitration of Napoleon III who awarded £3,800,000 to the company as compensation for the losses they would incur by the changes which Ishmael insisted upon in the original grant. Ismail then used every available means, by his own undoubted powers of fascination and by judicious expenditure, to bring his personality before the foreign sovereigns and public, and he had much success. In 1867 he visited Paris and London, where he was received by Queen Victoria and welcomed by the Lord Mayor. Whilst in Britain he also saw a British Royal Navy fleet review with the Ottoman Sultan. In 1869 he again paid a visit to Britain. When the canal finally opened, Ismail held a festival of unprecedented scope, inviting dignitaries from around the world. Yet these developments, especially the costly war with Ethiopia, left Egypt in deep debt to the European powers, and they used this position to wring concessions out of Ishmael. One of the most unpopular among the Egyptians and Sudanese was the new system of mixed courts, by which Europeans were tried by judges from their own states, rather than by Egyptian and Sudanese courts. But at length the inevitable financial crisis came. A national debt of over £100 million sterling had been incurred by the Khedive, whose fundamental idea of liquidating his borrowings was to borrow at increased interest. The bondholders became restive. Judgments were given against the Khedive in the international tribunals, when he could raise no more loans. He sold the Egyptian and Sudanese shares in the Suez Canal Company in 1875 to the British government for £3,976,582. This was immediately followed by the beginning of direct intervention by the great powers in Egypt and Sudan. In December 1875, Stephen Cave and John Stokes were sent out by the British government to inquire into the finances of Egypt and in April 1876 their report was published, advising that in view of the waste and extravagance it was necessary for foreign powers to interfere in order to restore credit. The result was the establishment of the Caisse de la Dette. 
In October, George Goshen and Joubert made a further investigation, which resulted in the establishment of Anglo-French control over finances and the government. A further commission of inquiry by Major Baring and others in 1878 culminated in Ishmael making over his estates to the nation and accepting the position of a constitutional sovereign. With Nuber as premier, Charles Rivers Wilson as finance minister, and Abliniers as minister of public works, as the historian Eugene Rogan has observed. The irony of the situation was that Egypt had embarked on its development schemes to secure independence from Ottoman and European domination, yet with each new concession, the government of Egypt made itself more vulnerable to European encroachment, Europe revolt and exile. This control of the country by Europeans was unacceptable to many Egyptians, who united behind a disaffected Colonel Ahmed Yorubi. The Yorubi revolt consumed Egypt, hoping the revolt could relieve him of European control. Ismail did little to oppose Yorubi and gave in to his demands to dissolve the government. Britain and France took the matter seriously, and insisted in May 1879 on the reinstatement of the British and French ministers. With the country largely in the hands of Europe, Ismail could not agree, and had little interest in doing so. As a result, the British and French governments pressured the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid II to depose Ismail Pasha, and this was done on June 26. 1879, the more pliable Tufik Pasha, Ismail's eldest son, was made his successor. Ismail Pasha left Egypt and initially went into exile to Rezna, today Erkulano near Naples, until 1885 when was eventually permitted by Sultan Abdul Hamid II to retire to his palace of Emirgan on the Bosphorus in Constantinople. There he remained, more or less a state prisoner, until his death. According to Time magazine, he died while trying to guzzle two bottles of champagne in one draft. He was later buried in Cairo. Honours, Order of Glory, Nishon Iftikhar, Grand Cordon of the Order of Leopold, 1862, Order of Nobility, Special Class, 1863, Order of Osmanier, Special Class, 1863. Grand Cross of the Order of the Sword, 1866. Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath, 1866. Grand Cross of the Order of the Netherlands Lion, 1866. Grand Cross of the Legion d'Honneur, 1867. Knight Grand Commander of the Order of the Star of India, 1868. Knight of the Order of the Most Holy Annunciation, 1868. Knight of the Order of the Black Eagle, 1868. Grand Cross of the Order of the Red Eagle, 1868. Grand Cross of the Order of Saints Maurice and Lazarus, 1869. Grand Cross of the Order of the Crown of Italy, 1869. Grand Cross of the Order of the Redeemer, 1869. Grand Cross of the Order of Leopold, 1869. Honorary Member. Bavarian Academy of Sciences and Humanities, 1874, Order of the Brilliant Star of Zanzibar, First Class, 1875, 